Episode number 125. Head on over to dadhackers.us slash 125 to get all the show notes and resources. What's up, Dad Hackers? My name is Patrick Antonucci, and I am the host and founder of this podcast and community of Dad Hackers. Dad Hackers is a community of Christian fathers who are devoted to encouraging, equipping, and enabling one another to become the men that God has created and called us to be so that we can raise up the next generation of fully devoted followers of Christ and leave a legacy of multi-generational faithfulness. Now, on this show, we primarily interview Christian men to dive deep into their experiences and insights into what it means to be a Christian man, a Christian husband, a Christian father, and a Christian leader. We ask questions that dig deep into the thinking and rationale and experiences of these men so that we can all learn and grow into the men that God is calling us to be. I'm so thankful that you've joined us today. Make sure you subscribe so that you never miss any of our value-packed episodes. Also, please make sure you leave an honest review if you're listening to this in iTunes or any other platform that takes reviews. Reviews boost the show's ratings, which means that more dads are going to come across our show and benefit from the content that we put out. I also wanted to let you know that we do have a free private Facebook group just for Christian dads. So after the show, make sure you hop on over to the show notes. There's a link for that in there as well. Paul, how you doing today, man? I have never been better, my friend. How is your soul? Uh, it's doing well. It's doing well. I'm, I'm on summer break. So uh, at the time of this recording, so, so it feels good. Appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, for you guys that are listening in, Paul's a really good friend of mine. We had him on the show um, in our very first year. One of, the, one of the first interviews that I did was with Paul. We met, I don't know, over two years ago. <laughs> and yep. since then, we, we've kept in touch a lot. Uh, we've talked on the phone a lot. We've talked about different strategies that we're doing in our businesses. And we've been a uh, big encouragement to one another. Uh, he, myself, and also Cam Hall, who's been on the podcast before. We, we've had many conversations, many Zoom calls um, over the past two years. And we, we've all been a, a really um, big encouragement to one another. And I know, know Paul's been a big influence. Uh, and we'll talk about influencing in a little bit. Uh, but he's been a big, big influence in things that I've done with Dad Hacker. So I'm excited to have him back on the show. And after you listen to this, make sure you go check out the original episode uh, that, that he and I did two, over two years ago now. Can you believe it's been two years, Paul? I still, I still remember that interview. And uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, when it's you and me and we're missing our third leg here, we're missing Cam, you know, it, uh, it really takes on that uh, quite a dynamic when we get the three of us going at the same time. But uh, oh, yeah. yeah, no, I, that was a, that was a, uh, a very memorable interview. I actually listened to it several times over. Um, after it, and not not just because I like listening to myself talk either, but I actually I thought you did a really fantastic job with that interview. So good on you. Well, Paul, why don't you take a minute and let us know a little bit about yourself? I'm sure we've gotten a ton more listeners since you originally were on the show, and I don't know how many of them went back and listened to the actual um, original episodes. So yeah, just a little introduction about yourself. Yeah, well, a greeting to everybody who was who did listen to the first one. Um, nice, nice to see you again, sort of. Um, and I'm back uh, in part. Uh, Cam and I have uh, Cam, Patrick and I have been uh, uh, building a, a, a very strong relationship over the past few years. Uh, but also, it coincides with um, a book that I'm releasing this year called Influencer Networking Secrets, uh, which is actually a version 3.0 of a book I published two years ago. Uh, and I've published one in, in between since then. <clears throat> this is the first one where I can actually tell you that what I tell you, what I teach in the book uh, is, the, is proof of concept, where I have actually built a brand new business within the last six months from scratch from the principles that I enumerate in the book. And um, other than that, uh, you know, in my, to, to keep the wolf at the door, I'm a executive ghostwriter of uh, books and content for influencers and thought leaders and executives. Um, in my spare time, I, uh, enjoy, uh, bodybuilding 
and uh, eating nutritiously. And I've got, I've been married 15 years. I've got boys of 11 and nine, live in Olympia, Washington. And um, I think, uh, oh, um, my mission in the kingdom, I should say, uh, is definitely for the hearts of younger men. Um, And so in the local church that I attend and in a, a, a ministry that I'm looking at forming here pretty soon, uh, love to help my younger brothers get a grip on where they are in life. Right on, man. It, it is so important for younger men to kind of latch on to men who are a season or two ahead of where they are. And mm-hmm. for men that are in our position where we're uh, a little bit further along to reach, reach back and find men who are maybe thinking about getting married or just married or just beginning to have children and be able to share some of the the experiences um, that we've had and and hopefully be able to help them avoid some of the pitfalls that we've made. And and I think that's a, that's a big thing that is much needed uh, in the church and in society at large, man. For sure. There's a, uh, there's a story. I don't have much time to go into this obviously, but there's a story in uh, Africa of a uh, game park that killed off all of its adult male elephant population, leaving behind only the females and the juveniles. And when the juvenile elephant, male elephants reached the age of adolescence, uh, they became very unruly and began killing other animals in the park Hmm. just for fun, it seemed. And this is because the elephant, uh, they, they go through a, um, a heightened state of sexual awareness, right? It's much like being, going through heat or something like that. But when there's no uh, outside influences to corral that, they just remain there. And so they were becoming just like young men and teenagers do when they're not supervised. Um, they're mm-hmm. becoming increasingly violent, reckless, um, and and unrestrained. And the solution that they that they came up with was they trucked in a couple of older bull male elephants, full adult male elephants, and uh, it wasn't very long before <laughs> all they had to really do was stomp their foot or trumpet at them a few times, and the younger male elephants backed off and realized, uh oh, <laughs> we've we've upset the old bull. We better we better back off a little bit. So I love that story. That is a great story because it, it, it perfectly illustrates and it's a perfect metaphor for what's going on and what's the the problems with what we have going on in, in society a lot with the, the father missing from many homes. And that, that's an excellent illustration of that. And we could, we could take up our whole conversation just talking about that. We could. Uh, but uh, I, I definitely want to get into your book. I want to hear your story, Paul, about how the proof of concept of your book. Well, let's, let's back up. Let's talk about the concept, the whole concept of your book and then how you've kind of been living that out and beginning to reap the rewards or benefit from the fruit or beginning to, to harvest some of the, the seeds that you've been planting, so to speak. Yeah. A great question. I, um, I was, you know, when, when you and I were last on this show together, Pat, I was, uh, coming out of a season of having done this at a very small local level here in Olympia, Washington, as, a, an, as an insurance agent. And I had been in, in three successful jobs of greater and greater influence and responsibility. And things kept happening for me that didn't seem to happen for other people. And I was uh, very much the way Steve Jobs tells us, you, can't, you can only connect the dots in reverse. Mm -hmm. Um, I was attempting to understand what does all this mean? Because I kept finding myself invited into rooms and talking to people I had no business talking to. And I had no business being in that room. And I would even have people who I knew in that room walk up to me and say, what are you doing here? (laughs) And I'd say that they called me in. (laughs) Um, and, uh, I was like, you know, is this just coincidence? Is this just, I mean, am I, because, you know, because ordinarily people are not that um, strongly affectionate towards me, right? I'm, I'm about average in terms of the amount of natural interest I, I, I attract from anybody. At least that's the way I would look at myself. 
Um, but I kept getting invited into these rooms and, and in front of these people and, and, and to these small gatherings, special things. And I wasn't the only one there. And, and I wasn't the only person. I mean, there were other people I knew who were there, but there weren't other people I knew in all of these different instances. Right. It, it became almost like a circuit for me. Like I, the one common denominator was me. And the, the faces changed in each room I was in. And occasionally two or three of the rooms had some of the same faces, but then five to 10 of the other ones didn't. And I, what I drew away from it was I had followed what I'd read in how to win friends and influence people as a boy. Um, which is, uh, which is a great book by Dale Carnegie. It's a perennial classic, but I had followed it so well so thoroughly and become so wedded to it as my main philosophy for doing business um, that I had become something far more than an insurance salesman. And in fact, you have to, if you're going to, yeah, in my opinion, if you're going to sell insurance, which is a product nobody likes and nobody wants to talk about and nobody really understands, then you've got to be a very um, reliable, trustworthy, dependable, predict, uh, not predictable, but um, consistent uh, type of person. And you've got to communicate that sense of, uh, you know, every, uh, 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 it's, it's safe, it's under control, right? Um, if I could just interject real quick with, a, sure. with a, some anecdotal evidence, if you will. I've, I've had a number of guys join our Ironman Mastermind who have been a part of Dad Hackers or listening to the podcast or following up on social media for a long time and um you know in getting to talking to them sometimes it's that they've seen me be consistent in doing what i'm doing that finally made them pull the trigger and get become a part of our membership group and so just mm -hmm. to give some anecdotal evidence like i said for that piece of being consistent uh, being persistent in what you do so just wanted to correct throw that in there for you well, they, and it, you, you're doing exactly that. You're, you're building influence because whatever, whoever else they might encounter day to day comes and goes. But when you keep showing up time and time again, and every time you show up, you've got something in your hand to give them, right? And, and this is metaphorical, right? We're not talking about you don't have a gift wrap, gift wrap box, right? right, right, to right. Give, but um, <clears throat> that that says something different to them that says something different to any human soul than the average the sum of the average of people they run into and over time i mean we'll get into the principles obviously the the the, the subcomponents of this but i realized i had been living out luke chapter 16 verse 9 and that is um i tell you use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves because so that when it's gone they'll welcome you into eternal dwellings um, that's about as succinct as a way as I can describe um, these principles that I thought about and understood. Uh, this is something I've done and done and done over and over and over and over again. And I keep seeing results from it. It's not an accident. This is intentional. This is cooperating with the way God has designed this universe. So that's sort of the background of it. Yeah, that that's... Um... I like how you, you brought out the Luke 16 verse 9 uh, passage there because it's good to know that these things that we're about to talk about are tied to biblical concepts. And, and this isn't some kind of new age thing or some kind of weird mystical thing we're talking about here. Um, in that, that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, I've, I've read it several times and um, it's just filled with, with good common sense about how to be a good person to other people. And uh, I think we've lost that to some extent in, in our culture and in our society. And so when you begin implementing those things, you rise to the top almost automatically. And um, you, you begin to stand out in a good way. And, and people notice that. So, Paul, tell us a little bit about your story with respect to uh, what's happened since being in the, the insurance 
industry because you're not still in there, right? Oh, no, no. <laughs> thank, thank goodness. Because <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants to talk about that. <laughs> no, but I'll tell you this, uh, just as a little anecdote of my own. Um, the business that I'm in now, although it's not as uh, hated as insurance, it is nonetheless a highly relational one. Because you can, you can pay somebody on Fiverr fractions of a penny of what I charge to do what I do, right? So if you don't care about a relationship and you just want a bunch of words written on a piece of paper because you're too lazy to do it yourself, you can get it for five bucks. Um, but that's not, what, that's not what I'm, who, I'm, who I'm after and that's not what my clients expect out of me. Anyway, beside the point. Um, yeah, what happened was uh, I, I got fired from my last insurance job, which was not long after. It was right about around the time that, that we, we did mm -hmm. that interview. Um, yeah. In fact, <laughs> now this is, this is interesting. I always have this memory of the first time I listened to it. I was driving up to um, Tacoma from Olympia to meet a friend for lunch, and he was trying to recruit me to his company because I had been fired. And that was the first time I noticed, oh, that, that episode has finally gone live. So I listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I got fired from that job and um, I proceeded to go into online entrepreneurship and I didn't know much about it, but I was um, inspired by everything I'd been learning and all the things that had been changing in my life on the physical side from Vince Del Monte, who had helped me lose all this, shed all this body fat and get into competition condition and all that. So I spent a majority of the second half of 2018 and all of 2019 trying to figure out what my offer was. And at first I had the first book, which I thought I would start selling online. That didn't happen. Um, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do behind it, whether it was a coaching program or a um, mastermind or something like that. That was where I felt like it should be. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about, but that I couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've been over that many, many moons. Yeah. Um, but none of it, I, I just didn't have the, um, there were a lot of things about it. I didn't realize, didn't know I would need to do, didn't have the, didn't really have the capital to put into it. I just started going into coaching programs and masterminds to learn how to do it. And that represented a, a lot of the money that I spent during this time trying to get into business. So um, eventually, I got to, uh, I, I came to the, my wit's end around uh, the, the latter half of 2019. But in the interim, you had introduced me to Aaron Walker, who appeared on my show first in April, March or April of 19. And I invited him back in October. The one thing I had not stopped doing throughout all this time was being a connector, being an influential person, knowing the right people and knowing how to put the, two, the right people together. That stuff I'd always understood. I'd always met one person in, at one end of the country and said, you should know this person at the other end of the country or on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. You should meet. You two should meet and talk. And that's what I did for Aaron. As soon as after he got off my show the first time, I started introducing him and introducing him. And once a month, I would send him an email introducing him to somebody and getting him booked on a, on a, on a couple of shows and all that, that kind of thing. And when he came back on the show, I, we had our second interview. We got done. We're on the post-interview chat. And he said to me, You've, you've introduced me to so many incredible people. You need to let me do something for you. Well, by this time, of course, I was getting ready to start going looking for, for a job and saying, okay, you know, I gave it a year and a half. I couldn't even make a dollar. So <laughs> it's a pretty good sign. That's, that's not, not what I was supposed to be doing. And um, I told him that. I said, look, I, I, I can't get a business started to save my life. I don't know what it is I'm doing wrong. And I don't know that I don't know that I'm doing it wrong. Right. right. I don't know yeah. what it is. And um, he sort of cut through all of that and said, listen, what's something you could, that you were really talented at that you could do? And I said, well, I've been a gifted writer my whole life. I can write for days and days and days. And he said, well, why don't we look at 
you, trying it out, you know, you can come and write content. I need a content writer for my team. I've got a bunch of stuff I need written and I physically can't get to it. And um, I accepted. And two months later, you know, you know how busy Aaron is, right? Oh, yeah. So, so two months later, he loved the content, right? He said, he, we, we're still working that to this day. I'm still part of his team. He said to me, uh, a couple of people came to him and said, okay, you're cranking out two blogs every week and all these Alexa briefs and all these snippets and tweets. And we know you are, you don't have time to do all that. So what's the secret, right? <laughs> and, uh, he said, I, I'm happy to tell you the secret. And, and, and so the long and the short of it is at the end of 2019, literally December 29th, my phone rings and it's, I need help with ghostwriting. How much do you, how much do you charge? And, um, clock ticks over into January. We finalize the deal. I've got my first paying client and boy, did that ever feel good. Proof of concept yeah. that re long-term relationship building with no expectation of return or no expectation, the expectation of return, but not directly from what you're necessarily from right, what you're like no strings attached type of correct giving. Yeah. But you're aware nonetheless that God is pleased when he sees one of his children obsessively obsessing and concerned with the needs of another one. Right. Right. And he rewards that. So that's, I guess, I hope that tells the story, uh, does it justice. Yeah, and and since then, that's that's led to quite a few more clients for you. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, several clients came out of that. Word began to spread among. Yeah, you know, it's funny how many people you run into these days that are on the other side of the world, and they're like, "Oh, I've heard of you." <laughs> <laughs> a couple of people I know have told me about you, right? So, um, so yeah, I mean, they're popping up all over the place. I'm getting more and more opportunities. It's getting. Um, I'm getting to the point now where I need to do my first sort of uh, quantum leap and scale the the price and the the, the scope and size of what I do. Um, and I'm getting I'm also acquiring a team underneath me, uh, starting to put people in place who hand it who support me in the writing and then also um, administrative support and uh, and other creative elements. Yeah, which are are just as equally important because you could get buried in administrative tasks and working too hard on that and not able to spend the. I mean, we were just you and I were just talking about this the other day. Not have the time to invest to to scale your business because you're so busy doing all these administrative tasks that really somebody else could easily do. It's not vital to the success of your business that you do them. Yep. So you could easily pass them off. To somebody else of course you've got to pay them and everything um, but if you see that as an investment in your business and, and it frees up your time to do the thing that only you can do that really scales your business and, and builds it and grows it then then I think that's a better way to to kind of look at things yes absolutely and uh, I will say that um, that I began, to, I, I actually felt myself physically, my shoulders physically seemed to levitate two or three inches up higher than they had been. <laughs> the first time, Joanna, my virtual assistant, the first time I saw one of my podcast episodes get uploaded, what it, it looks like it's happening automatically. You just look down at your phone. Oh, a new podcast episode just dropped. I didn't even remember, remember uploading it. Oh, that's right. I didn't upload it. Joanna right. uploaded it. <laughs> and, uh, Anyway, she does a terrific job. And um, ever since then, you know, I, I finished recording my episode. I put it on Asana. She does the uploading. Uh, Gatlin, my first staff writer, he does the show notes. And Thomas, my desi uh, thumbnail designer, does the thumbnail, uploads it, and then I, I wash my hands of it. It's wonderful. That's nice. And then you can really concentrate on the things that, that only you can do. Mm hmm and more time to think. Yeah. Yeah. Or free you up to, you know, have an extra hour with your family or take mm -hmm. your wife on a date <laughs> or not or get a little bit more sleep, you know, or things. just, or just finish your work day and just sit there and not feel like I've got a million more things to do. Yeah. 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 That's a great feeling. So let, let's dive into a, a little bit more of some of the principles that, that you outline 
in your in your book. What are um, some of the things that you teach others uh, in your book? Well, there's basically five core concepts here that um, that are there. There, these are thirty thousand foot concepts. So they will specifically they'll look different for each and every business. Um, but the first one has everything to do with becoming the kind of person um, who commands good, well-paid, um, reliable customer relationships, right? Um, and I, so I call it be a magnet, not a pusher. And uh, yeah, j just to put it real simply, I mean, if you're coming at business from a, a place of desperation, um, if you are an arrogant sort of pushy salesperson, always trying to get people to buy something and never understanding what, why they buy and not even really caring, just saying, just buy this, buy this, buy that, you know, that's the caricature. And then there's the reality, which is that <clears throat> um, most people are paying far less attention than they could to the, the whole idea of creating a natural gravitational pull towards yourself by being a, a, a problem solver up front, by being a helping hand up front, by, by not caring for them temporarily about whether or not you get a sale, because that's not why you're in the room. You're in there to meet people and to seek opportunities. And those opportunities may not always be opportunities where you make money. They might be opportunities to be a blessing to someone else. In fact, most of the time, I'd say that's what it is because very few people show up to a networking group or a luncheon or a trade show or a conference thinking, how can I solve someone else's problem? Mm -hmm. They show up thinking, how can I solve my problem? <laughs> right? How can I meet all these people and, and get them into my book of business? Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you come, at, you come at people from a totally different frame of mind and background and set of priorities when you sit, when you say, no, I'm going to be magnetic. Um, I'm going to create conditions that the right people, uh, that I will polarize, right? That the right people will be drawn towards me. The wrong people will be repelled. And that doesn't mean that I'm not talking here about thugs and criminals. I'm talking about people whose personalities clash with you or they're your competitors or they don't, you know, that's, you're going to create that distinction by being magnetic. So Paul, talk to me a little bit about this. And that is you, you did this type of um, personal magnetism while you were in the insurance industry. And then when you moved to online entrepreneurship, you were doing this sort of thing for 18 months, roughly, like you said, before you made a dollar and, and you were in this to, to create a business online doing things like that. What kept you going? Because 18 months is, is a long time um, to some to continue to work at something without really seeing much of a return. Um, what kept you going? Well, um, there's a couple things. Um, first of all, you realize I realized after six years from when I finished my uh, bachelor's degree that I was still earning less than I had before I had my bachelor's degree. Um, and I was not getting promoted. I was not getting a raise. I wasn't getting uh, considered for management. I wasn't none of that, right? I was, I was basically running around on a hamster wheel. And creatives like me, if we're forced into a situation where we've got to take a sales job because we don't have any of those um, hard left brain skills, right? We're not engineers or mm. mechanics or anything like that. Um, very often, it, it's entirely possible for that to happen. I'm not the only person that that's happened to. But then I also realized that... Um, that, that, that there is a huge, especially nowadays, this may not have been true 20 or 30 years ago, but especially nowadays, especially in the decade that we're finishing out here and starting a new one, there is this vast, wide open, um, unregulated 
expanse called the internet where you don't have to be the world's most famous person uh, to earn a very comfortable living. In fact, it's better that you're not. It's, it's better that you're only, as my friend Matt Johnson says, famous and influential to a micro group of the right people. So there was that. Um, but above all, I really, uh, you know, devotion, uh, devotion has been a, a, a part of my life for 15, yeah, 15 years. I read the word of God every day and I believe he speaks. And I looked at the events of my life. I looked at the, the resurgence after nearly driving myself off the cliff, going back to an addiction. I looked at the, <clears throat> the way he had turned my life around since I went to Wild at Heart Boot Camp in, in the summer of 2017. I looked at how everything that had worked for me in insurance suddenly stopped working. I was doing the same thing, but I couldn't, and I was still getting leads but I couldn't close any of them. Every single one of them was a dud. I looked at all that. I looked at my prospects in the insurance business. And I said, I think, I think internally, I said, I think my time in the insurance business as a training environment has come to an end. And it's, and what the Lord is doing now is he's saying, okay, now we're, we're going to, we're going to take you to the next uh, place, the next season right? Um, so, you know, it was, to me, it was, it was divinely orchestrated, divinely inspired, divinely spoken, prophesied. And um, also the alternative was just plain uh, intolerable for me by that time. All right, guys, wanted to take a quick second to tell you about the Iron Men Mastermind. If you're looking for a band of brothers that you can lock shields with that can go to battle with you in the day-to-day -day life who are also in the trenches going through the same struggles and the same challenges that you are going through, I suggest you check out the Iron Men Mastermind. This mastermind was developed and designed for Christian men to help us become the men that God has created and called us to be. And it's designed to help us increase our relationship with God, increase our relationship with our wives, increase our relationship with our children, and begin to provide better for them financially, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, relationally, in all of those areas, those areas that those things that wake you up in the middle of the night. These are the kinds of things that we work on. These are the kinds of ways that we can help you out in the Ironman Mastermind. If this is something that is of interest to you, you may want to join the Ironman community and you can check out more information at dadhackers.us slash Ironman, one word, Ironman there. All right, now back to our show. Yeah, it sounds like you had a really, I guess like a, people call it your why, like why mm -hmm. you're doing it was really fleshed out. The how, like you said, you were, you were thinking about coaching, ma creating mastermind groups, and, and now you do ghostwriting. The how wasn't necessarily solidified, but you knew why you were doing it. Mm -hmm. And that really kept you going because this, the, the type of principles you're teaching aren't a get rich quick scheme, aren't a microwave package. They don't necessarily quote pay off overnight. Uh, in your case, it might look like an overnight success if somebody's looking at what you're doing uh, from the outside and doesn't know all the hustle that you put in uh, during those 18 months. And you see, wow. Paul just started a business and it's exploding in, in six months. And Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, most, most overnight successes are a lifetime in the making. Um, but yeah, let, let's get back to those five core concepts. So you were talked about uh, personal magnetism. What's next? Uh, I've got, you know, these are some uh, overarching ones. One is uh, pro bono publicity. And this is podcasting is a prime example of this. You can do it other ways, right? You can, you can go and do uh, video interviews and promote other businesses. You can set up a trade publication and promote people through articles. Um, 
this is done all over the place. It's just nobody's really thought of it. Everybody thinks of it as paid advertising. And, and a lot of it is, right? But not all of it is. Some people get advertising for free. The best kind of advertising. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you get people, how do you turn people who um, don't have a media platform into walking, talking billboards for you? And the answer is you who have a media platform become a walking, talking billboard for them, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, just to, to illustrate your concept, you've been advertising Aaron Walker and Vince Del Monte, and you and I have both advertised for, for Cam Hall. And um, Cam's actually worked with several guys in our Ironman group, and one of them, mm -hmm. Ed, Ed is always posting on social media. And I don't know how many clients Cam has gotten through Ed. And Ed does it takes one. Yeah. Ed, I'll tell you, Ed, he posts on social media a lot, but he's not like a, a ministry leader. He's not, he doesn't really have a blog or anything like that, but he's connected Cam with a lot of people because he's a, he's got results from what Cam does with him. And mm -hmm. he's, he literally is a walking, talking billboard for that guy. <laughs> oh, he's a beast. Yeah. yeah. I, I've, I'm friends with Ed and he, See, there's a, an example. There's just an average guy with an extraordinary story yeah. of dropping all that weight. Yeah. And, and, and the same thing that happened for me with Vince. You know, I was 250 pounds. I was 26.5% body fat. Next thing you know, I weigh under 200 pounds and I'm, you know, 11%. Of course, I'm going to talk that up on Facebook, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and Vince came on my show and he said, you're my biggest unpaid promoter I've ever had. <laughs> and I said, well, you'll get my bill in the mail. But <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, exactly. Pro bono publicity. Um, the other side of this is uh, not for profit is for profit. And um, yeah, that's going to take a little bit of explaining. Well, it, it, only in the sense that uh, people don't understand what a lot of people don't really understand what they're looking at when they see an, a nonprofit organization. Um, they think oh, it's a group of people who help disadvantaged people or that kind of thing. Yes, that's a very bare bones explanation of it. The real magic in, in a not-for-profit is that most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time, people who are busy volunteering and doing the, the grunt work and the hard work and the executive leadership of running those things are entrepreneurs because they're the ones who have the freedom of, of flexibility of schedule to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to build business alliances with other entrepreneurs, one of the quickest ways you can do that is supporting their cause. And a lot of people think, well, that means I've got to write checks. No, no. In fact, it's probably the, the last thing they want. Um, they're grateful for the money, of course, but what they're really doing is they're carrying a burden by themselves or with a very small group of people who care about it. Then you come along and add your firepower to that and your network and all the people that you can connect them to, to, to get whatever they need, procure prizes for a raffle or an auction, uh, procure a venue for an event they want to have, um, find a, an inexpensive way of, 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 of uh, administering these essential services that, that, that they need during a, a charity marathon or golf tournament or something like that. And you just build bonds like you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. Um, plus if you come and get your hands dirty, right? If you primarily lend time and talent as opposed to treasure, if you come and get your hands dirty, you get to have off the cuff, authentic conversations that have nothing to do with business. And it's all about their personal life, their passions and interests. You get to know those people in a, in a way you don't get to know them if you just meet them in a networking group and sit down to talk business. It's not, it's not that either one's better than the other. It's just they're different. Right, right. And uh, to this day, the largest client I ever got in the insurance business was as a result of volunteering to be the male MC for the Miss Lewis County pageant, which is a Miss America pageant here locally. Um, Largest client I got, my co-hostess was a, an executive with the Line X Corporation. And she also owned a small empire. They owned a franchise. They owned several properties down south of where I live. And over the course of about six months, she migrated her entire 
insurance portfolio under my care. Wow. And it was, it was well over a hundred thousand dollars in premium a- annually. Um, and all that because I was willing to get dressed up in a tuxedo and run my mouth for a couple hours announcing this is, and now we have our, our winner. <laughs> yeah. So, well, you talk about people getting their hands dirty. It, it's one thing to write a check. And I think about this in terms of church. It's relatively speaking, it's easy to throw a $20 in the offering plate or write a check for $200 or whatever. Cause mm-hmm. you just do that and you're done. Yeah. It may be a sacrifice to give that money, but you get in and you serve, you, you, you get involved in a ministry where you're actually investing your time, investing your talent. You are much more connected to that cause than if you just put money in the plate. A lot of churches uh, that aren't financially struggling, what they need is more people doing the work. It's like 20% of the people doing 80% of the work, or maybe the figures aren't even that good. They, they need more people working. And um, like we were talking earlier, when you implement these principles, when you go in and get your hands dirty, you naturally begin to stand out and kind of rise to the top, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, What's more valuable, you or your money? Very good. Yeah. I mean, you can always get more money, but not Only to sound arrogant, but yeah, I, I'm irreplaceable. And Only so are you, year. Paul. And, and so are you, dad hacker, listening to this right now. You are mm-hmm. not, not to, like I said, not to sound arrogant, but you are irreplaceable. And this goes back to what you and I were talking about a little bit ago. When you're, now you're, you're delegating some of these administrative tasks so that you can focus on what only Paul can do, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, and and um, you know, I just just before we got on, and I, I, I know we're get dwindling on time here. I saw an article posted by one of these publications, generally that philosophically I agree with, right? And they're talking about the all the young people out there protesting in the streets right now at the time of recording, and that and it's it's the same old shtick about how we're losing our young people because of the college campuses are teaching all of this, you know, anti-American propaganda. And philosophically, I would say I incline to agree with that. However, pointing fingers and bad mouthing your political opponents is not going to change those young people's minds. Yeah. Getting your hands dirty and helping them and teaching them and guiding them and mentoring them and giving a damn about them. That's what changes their hearts and minds. So go get involved if you want your kids back. This is why I have a, a comment rule on Facebook where I, I don't typically comment on political or religious posts that are controversial. Mm-hmm. Um, if somebody puts a, a negative comment on my stuff, I'll usually reply to them. I have a one, one reply rule that I, I, I adhere to pretty well. And that is because I don't think anybody ever convinced anybody else in the comments on social media or a social media comment debate. Uh, Most of the time you end up just both looking like idiots and it's a big waste of time. Oh yeah. So, well, as we um, have our last couple of minutes here, I'd like you to maybe briefly go over the the last two concepts that, um, that you have in your, in your book. Sure. Um, persuasive and print um, is the next one. And all this is getting pe- trying to get people to do is realize that um, when you remove your, the sound of your voice, the expression on your face, the body language, the tonality and all that from your communication, you must be even more attentive to what it says, how it says it, how it's likely to be perceived and whether or not this is the appropriate medium to use it. Mm-hmm. The way I learned this was by becoming a copywriter because copywriters are always going through lists, checking off is, is what I've written here have anything to do with the conversation already taking place in the consumer's mind. Because if you can't connect with them at a soul level, in other words, if you cannot project empathy and connection in your written words, you have no business sending that message is is my philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so I lay out a very, a series of guidelines and also just a a couple of examples that say, this is how I communicate in print. 
Um, and, and here are situations where I refuse to communicate in print. If people want to text their anger or their some things to me or, or send them on instant messenger, um, I will reply and say, we need to have this conversation face to face. And 99% of the time they go away. <laughs> I'm not trying to intimidate them. Right, right. But I'm saying, I can't hear the tonality in your voice. Mm -hmm. I can't judge the, you might be rip roaring mad or you just might be a little bit irked and you know, we can smooth it over, but I'm not taking the chance. Right. How I'm, many times it, have you sent a text or an email to your wife or a coworker or a client even, and you meant it one way, they took mm -hmm. it a total different way. Um, because there isn't the, all that nonverbal communication going on. You just have the text. I guess you could throw exclamation points and some emojis in there, if, you know, but then that, that's a whole another thing. But yeah. Well, especially if you're a guy like me who has a very dry sense of humor, right? To, so some people tell me, I could, even when you're in person, I can't tell if you're kidding or serious. I'm like, exactly, that's the idea. But <laughs> the point of that is exactly what you said, right? It's, it's don't take the risk. Mm -hmm. Make the phone call, set up the Zoom chat, make sure it's face-to-face -face or don't have the conversation. Yeah, and that, that's particularly hard because as we move more and more and more toward texting, I think each, I don't even want to say generation because it doesn't take that long, but it gets harder and harder and harder to have tough conversations face-to-face. How much easier is it to send somebody a, a, a hard piece of news through a text or an email versus actually picking up the phone and talking to them? But picking up the phone and talking to them, you're going to communicate or meeting them face to face. You're going to communicate more effectively, efficiently, and, and concisely and precisely what you're trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. you know, in the school that I work in, it's an online school. So we, we do a lot through messaging and email, but they tell us if you have a parent that is upset or concerned about something, you really need to get on the phone with them because things can be easily misconstrued, misconstrued through texting or um, email because you don't have all that nonverbal uh, communication uh, there. Especially in this, especially in this age with so much of the spirits of hatred and acrimony in the air. Yes. Yeah. I mean, just people are, are hair trigger waiting for something to, to set them off. Yeah. We got yeah. the neighbors down the street. It was a, it was a great moment of being a father. Um, blew his top at my kids. Um, a few, a few days back, they came home and told us, and of course, the first natural instinct of, as a father is, right, well, let me go grab my 12-gauge shotgun. And you know, <laughs> I, I didn't do that. Right. Um, the very next thing I said is, oh, I'm being baited here. Enemies, this, I, I know who's behind this. Yeah. And so I said, boys, we're going to pray for that man. We're going to bring the love of Christ against him. We're going to pray blessing and 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 we're going to thank God for him. And we're going to pray just an overflowing of the love of Christ on his, his home, his family, everything. And um, anyway, just a little side note, since we're, we're on the show we're on, you asked me, um, the other, uh, the last one is the curator. Um, and this is, this sounds a little bit, it's, it's a little bit more complex than it sounds. Um, it's really about uh, aligning choices very consistently so that you have um, relationships and outcomes and customers and values and all of that curated so that they work synergistically with each other like a pinball machine. The ball just bounces back and forth, zigzags, and it hits off one and goes to the next, and that just keeps getting returned, right? Because they work in tandem with each other. And what I was attempting to get people to realize here is there's people who want to do business with you and you shouldn't do business with them. Mm. And there's people you want who want to be friends with you and you shouldn't be friends with them. And there's people who, um, and there are outcomes very easily that are very seductive within us, pulling us down, pulling us back down to our animal nature, right? And we should say no to them and we should learn how to say no to them. Because it's a spiritual essence. And if you learn how to talk back to it, it'll go away. Hmm. 
but um, we're not being taught a lot of that. That's a whole nother podcast. Mm-hmm. I don't attempt to get that deep into the spiritual warfare thing in the book, but it's just, that's where that's coming from. As I recognize everybody, whether they're a, a, a believer in Jesus Christ or not, are wrestling with their lower self, the flesh. And we need to have some awareness of that so that we can talk back to it and say, no, this is who I choose to be. This is how I choose to be. And this is who I choose to be it with. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that, anyway, yeah. <laughs> that's a really good point because when, when you have this, almost like this code you live by, opportunities will present themselves, but you don't have to accept every opportunity that, that comes before you. Here, here's an example. I was approached, I don't know, maybe a year or so ago with a guy who was, I can't remember exactly what he was doing, but he was writing a book about dads and, and doing some kind of thing. And he wanted to do a collaboration and basically get access to my audience and um, promote his thing and give me some kickback. And I thought about it and I prayed about it and we weren't, while both of us were in the dad's space, so to speak, we didn't have enough alignment that I felt comfortable exposing my audience to him. So I had to pass mm. on that. Uh, that was an opportunity that presented itself, but I had to pass on that because I have some principles. I run my business and I run dad hackers by, and I have to be very careful with what I kind of throw at, the dads and the dad hackers community and all the men in the community uh, because I, I need to have their trust. I need to have their confidence that what I'm putting before them is for their best interest and not just trying to, to grab a couple of extra bucks and say, Hey, check this guy's thing out. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You, uh, you have to, you have to know, well, you know, as the saying goes, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. <laughs> yeah. And sorry to bring up the poker analogy, but it's, <laughs> it, it's true. Okay, there's, 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 I, I, well, you'll learn so much from playing that game, Texas Hold'em. I've, I've, I've played it so many times. I know I can, I can start to tell by how the other players are at the table. And this is total amateur. There's probably Texas Hold'em players listening to this going to totally say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I only know what I'm talking about in an amateur level, right? At a total yeah, yeah, yeah. beginner level. But I knew enough not to bet every time. Because when I started out, I would just, oh, we're betting, so I got to bet. No, you don't have to bet. You can fold. <laughs> you can yeah. check, right? Yeah. Same. It's the same kind of thing. When, what are the odds? What are, who are we dealing with here? Um, who's still in the game versus who's out. And, and we had a group where I could tell, you know, if there were certain players still in the game and me, time to get out of that, get out of that rodeo, pal, because you're not going to win it, right? Because yeah. these guys play for keeps. Other guys, you know, more laid back. They're not really, they, sometimes they win, most of the time they don't. Okay, I can take a bet against that. Unless I had like, you know, four of a kind and I was just, there's no way I'm not winning this round. Um, then I would, I would go the guys who were really good if I knew that they're not going to beat this, this hand, but that's very hard to do. So anyway, um, yeah, it's just, you gotta, and, and, and you gotta know, you gotta, you gotta develop a, a, a framework and say, okay, this is the type of person I want to be around. These are the type of experiences I want to have. This is the kind of business person I want to be and everything else. Um, I'll consider it, but I'm not chasing after it. Right. Some, some wild offshoots may fit the mold, even though they're not a target, but I'm not chasing after them. They can come to me if they want to work with me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Paul, we're, we're kind of out of time here. Um, mm-hmm. I appreciate you being on the show. If, if guys want to get a hold of your book, tell us when, when's it coming out? Uh, what's the best way to get connected with you and things like that? We got a special uh, link that's going to be in the show notes there, thepaulsedwards.com forward slash dad hackers. And if you sign up, subscribe to the list, you will be, a, you get a free copy. It's going to come out September of 2020, Influencer Networking Secrets. Um, and so just go there, sign up for that, and then um, you'll be in. <laughs> awesome. I'll be sure to put that in the show notes so you guys can easily 
uh, take advantage of that. And you said a free copy of the book. Mm -hmm. Awesome, man. Awesome. Very generous of you practicing your practicing what you're preaching, huh? Give up front sacrifice and, and reap a reward. Yeah. Yeah. Demand the reward up front and you'll sacrifice a lot of stuff you don't want to. Good point. Good point. Well, Paul, one last question before we wrap it up. And, um, you might have seen this coming, but in, in your opinion, what makes a great dad? Oh, not, not much has changed for me since the last time you asked that question. Um, <laughs> Got to be consistent, right? Our, our father in heaven um, is absolutely nuts about the growth, maturity, success, magnitude, and impact of his sons. We were born that way. We were made that way. We're different from, from Eve and her daughters. Uh, Eve is just as impactful, but just in a different way. Um, John Eldridge has a good illustration. He said, you notice how uh, women can look quite inviting and appealing in a painting um, underneath a bed sheet with not much on. But if you put men doing it, they look kind of silly. Um, <laughs> that's telling you something about the way we're created, right? We, but right. men at work, right? Men charging ahead into the battlefield, men lifting an enormous boulder with their buddies, men rescuing each other, carrying each other off the battlefield. That is very masculine. And uh, what he's, what he's pointing out there is we were born to have that kind of impact. Um, but we can't get it unless we are willing to be, um, unless we're willing to live a life of surrender, submission, intimacy, union, and, uh, and shared creativity that is unique to the way God has created us with our Heavenly Father. Um, so if that's what you want, then the first step is repentance and, and getting close to the chief shepherd again. Um, and I can, I can teach on that, but not now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate those wise insights, Paul. And I appreciate you coming back on the show and I look forward to the version 3.0 of your influencer networking secrets coming out in September. And uh, thanks again. I appreciate it, brother. Thanks, Pat. Great to be back with you. All right, gentlemen, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope our conversation was a blessing to you and that you leave this episode better equipped to be the man and the father God has called and created you to be. If so, then I ask that you please leave us a five-star rating and a quick written review in iTunes. Then make sure you head on over to the show notes to get all of the resources for this episode. While you're there, you can take part in our five days to be a better dad challenge, as well as get involved with our free Facebook community. All right, gentlemen, until next week, remember Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Stay sharp.